shut down Wall Street, the Wall Street casino that devastated America's working families in 2008. He led the successful fight to end predatory mortgage loans <clears throat> and to create a consumer cop on the beat, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, to block the emergence of deceptive wealth stripping financial practices. He has also championed many other issues, such as enabling our farmers to drive their farm trucks across state lines. Uh, I'm sure that's important to hear uh, in Tillamook County. Designing the framework for our small businesses to raise capital through uh, uh, crowdfunding. He can tell you about that. I can't. Um, and leading the effort to bring our sons and daughters home from Afghanistan. He, he is also the Senate leader in fixing the filibuster and restoring our broken Senate so they can take on the big issues facing America. I think we all know about that. He really stuck his neck out because he recognized that the Senate is broken. We just can't get anything done. It didn't go as far as you would like to have gone, but you got it started, still at it. <laughs> Jeff is a native Oregonian and a son of a millwright. He was born in Myrtle Creek, Oregon, and his family moved uh, with the timber economy to Roseburg, and then he moved on to East Multnomah County. He represented uh, East Multnomah County as a state representative and the Speaker of the House. Jeff holds an open town hall meeting every, in every Oregon uh, county every year. This is his, how many, how many times do you think he's been here? Any guesses? Do the math, Jerry. <laughs> who, who said that? I heard it. Seven? Seven times. Amazing. We're all getting older, aren't we? <laughs> so he's been here seven times, and that's, I think that's pretty darn impressive. So please uh, welcome Oregon's U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley. Yeah. Ken, thank you very much. I, I think you first ran for the county commissioner in 1998. Is that right? Um, yes. And no, Savior, that's, that's right. Would Savior, I ran for the state legislature, so we've been on this journey 17 years together, and thank you for doing such a great job for the county. And if we have our, a number of local elected leaders here, so if they could just stand quickly and introduce themselves, it'd be great. Valerie, thank you for your Mayor Mark and Debbie and I have been serving together, we served a long time together in the legislature. Welcome, Sharon. Good to have you. I'm State Representative uh, David Gombrich. Uh, Ned represents from 3rd Street North. I represent from 3rd Street and South Jenny South all the way to uh, Tiaha. So thanks for being in my district today. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. And, and uh, Representative Gomberg is going to be at my second town hall later this afternoon as well. So thank you for <laughs> traveling on the road. And apologies if I could have to stay away in a few minutes to attend a memorial service for Sarah Sipper, who many of you know. So uh, I will be able to stay for the whole meeting here. At this in Tillamook. Great, great to have you. Anyone else? And Rosie, do you want to let folks know you're you're here for uh, Senator Roblin? I'm Rosie Shannon. Um, I represent Senator Army Roblin, and we represent all the way from Coons Bay up to Third Street, and we've been Coons Bay at um, other events today, so I couldn't make it where I was Well, these folks are on the front line, and they're dealing with the expected challenges, but also the unexpected. So let's show them a little appreciation. <laughs> Joel Corcoran is here, if you could wave his hand in the back. Joel is head of my constituent services team. I have a team that, that basically helps citizens in Oregon uh, cut the red tape when they run into uh, challenges. Those challenges might be in terms of uh, Medicare, might be veterans who are trying to access their, access their veterans benefits. It could be that you're dealing with a bank over a, a potential foreclosure, but you can't get to anyone real in the bank and you need someone to help get you through to a decision maker. Uh, we have folks who specialize in working all those kinds of issues. And if you have something like that that you're wrestling with, uh, if you sometime during this meeting you let Joel know, uh, he will have the appropriate team member follow up with you. And we'll, we can't resolve every issue, but there's a surprising number of things that get resolved a lot more quickly when our office calls people up and says, what's, what's going wrong here? Why hasn't the citizens been helped the way they should be helped? 
Uh, so, uh, and Joel, you sing a little, little bit after yeah. me. You'll stay a little after me as, as, as well. So, um, at the start of each town hall, I like to shine a light on something positive that is, is strengthening the community and, uh, and present a, a U.S. flag to the group, the flag that has been flown over the, the Capitol. And so, today, that, that group is the Tillamook High School FFA. Uh, it used to be Future Farmers of America, but now you just go by FFA, is that right? Okay, uh, roughly kind of expanding set of missions that, that the, the group is undertaking. Uh, so we have uh, students here, and uh, I think I'm maybe short on name, but Allison, do we have Allison? Allison is here, uh, and Summer, great, and Houston, and I'm missing, what's your name? Rachel. Rachel, and Rachel. So they were recognized at the National FFA Convention for growing microgreens. Now I've never heard the word microgreens before, so I'm going to have one of, of these outstanding students uh, explain it. But growing microgreens in a hydroponic system, and they received uh, national grant funding for the project. Why don't you all come up while I'm finishing talking here. And they are partnering with a school in Kenya to teach them how to grow microgreens, and then the microgreens are donated to the, the food bank. So who would like to explain to us what microgreens are? Great. Who's in? Well, microgreens are simply young sprouts of vegetables such as cabbage, kohlrabi, kale, and they're grown for about two weeks before they are harvested. And they're filled with nutrients and they're delicious. Is this kind of the, uh, the vegetable equivalent of uh, beet sprouts? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, well, that's cool. And so, what are the advantages of doing this in a hydroponic uh, setting? Well, you are able to have a much quicker harvest along with uh, more, it's more easy to ma maintain because you're not dealing with soils and pots and everything. It's just a system that you can uh, harvest out of really easily and seed really easily. And I think I, I think you're going to have It's very cool. And do any of you want to add anything? Anyone want to explain how you got into this partnership with the school in Kenya? No. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> But it, by your communication with them, are you using the internet and, and yeah? Originally, we started out where we were communicating with them. Well, okay, so we started out with communications by emails, and Mr. Sherman helped us, and we made a class called International Ag Class, and so our first project was to get computers so we could communicate back and forth, and um, so they we kind of we taught them about the hydroponic system, and I do know that. Um, Grace, I don't, I can't remember her last name, but she's from one of the Kenyan schools. But I know that their community is now building one so that they can take it to the technical uh, science fair in Kenya. But um, I. Uh, <laughs> that was well done. <laughs> well, congratulations. Not only is it very interesting science, and I looked up some pictures on the internet of the work they're doing, and and uh, so I encourage you to to uh, consider doing the same. And it's a whole interesting branch of the agricultural world, and now you're throwing a little international relations into it as well. So, well done, and congratulations. And here is a certificate uh, of appreciation for the work you're doing, the leadership in the community, and a, and a flag for you all to use in your chapter as you see would like. Well done.
selling lunch. A crew people. out at the uh, fairgrounds, so when you leave the meeting here, so people go buy lunch at the... Uh... Probably be over with by then, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Uh, but please consider ways to be partners or help with the, with the school groups. Uh, uh, the, uh, it really creates strong connection with the community, and, and this is a really good project. Uh, so I'm going to share a few things, and then uh, Houston's going to ask our first question, and then we're going to go to the tickets and just have, have you all uh, uh, raise questions or make points. If somebody's speaking you completely disagree with, please still give them the courtesy of letting them have their, their moment, and we'll ask everyone to do the same when it's, when it's your turn. To just kind of warm up the conversation, I want to mention a few things that have been going on. One is uh, I've been fighting for uh, port dredging funds set aside from the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, and uh, it looks like we're going to get that again this year. We got it through the first round of the committee process, so keep your fingers crossed. Uh, similarly, uh, in terms of being the first round, we were, I was able to get language in that uh, will secure funding for the Newport helicopter station here on the coast, and we still have to get that through the other rounds and to the president, uh, but that was a huge battle last year when the Coast Guard was considering shutting it down. And uh, I, I think we're in, in pretty good foundation for going forward. Then another thing that just happened that's really strong for Oregon, uh, Senator Wyden and I have been fighting for a change in how firefighting is funded uh, because um, it's been funded by when there the, you, you go past the initial appropriation, instead of it being funded by the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, it's been funded by depleting everything else the Forest Service does. And that means planning future timber sales or forest uh, health uh, programs to thin trees to reduce the risk of fire. We've been robbing fire prevention to pay for fire fighting. And if uh, this provision, now adopted by the Senate Appropriations Committee, uh, if we can get all the way through, that will change that. And that would be important. We just had uh, a decision by the Veterans uh, uh, administration that it was an issue that was brought to me by a veteran in Oregon that folks, our veterans exposed to Agent Orange and the C-123 tankers were not getting treatment for their health concerns. I've been fighting that battle for well three to four years now and we just won this week. The VA put out an announcement they're going to care for our, our veterans with that Agent Orange so, uh, impact. So that's a victory. Uh, a challenge uh, ahead of us is the Highway Trust Fund, uh, which is running out of money. Another challenge is um, the sequestration affecting the non-defense programs and an effort to uh, essentially fund defense off budget so that it doesn't have to balance out with non-defense. So the budget has in it uh, huge cuts to everything from Medicare to uh, food stamps and so on and so forth, everything on the non-defense non side. That's a, that's a real concern. Uh, we are having a big debate over a trade, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm happy to share more comments, uh, concerns about the fast track or Trans-Pacific uh, partnership. But this is setting up a framework for our, how our economy works with other economies, uh, and that framework is going to be here for a generation. And whether it's designed right or not, it's going to have a huge impact on whether or not we have good paying jobs here in the United States. So that's just a few things to get us uh, thinking about the issues right before Congress. And I should mention we just also had this big battle over replacing the Patriot Act with the USA Freedom Act. USA Freedom Act stops the bulk collection of, of our uh, phone records. And it also has in it my bill for ending secret law. We have had a court established under the Patriot Act, a secret court, in that its decisions, or its proceedings are secret, and its decisions have been secret. So even when it interprets the law and changes the meaning of the law, we as American citizens got no notice that, that this court had decided that the language meant something different than it would appear from a plain reading. So that's just wrong in a democracy. You have to know how a court has interpreted the law, or you can't possibly respond with new legislation or ask your, your representatives to pursue new legislation. And so uh, that principle, uh, is embedded in the USA Freedom Act, my, my no secret law bill, and I'm very pleased to, about that. So Houston's going to give us our first question or comment. Okay. Why don't you use this one? Over the past 
past few years, the economy has seen some recovery, yet rural America is still struggling. Legislation, ballot measures, and initiatives seem to favor urban America. What is being done to help stabilize and protect our farm, fishing, and forestry industries? Yeah, yeah no, thank you. It's a good question. The, uh, and our farm, forest, and fishing are, by the way, all being hit pretty hard uh, by some of the, the loss of snowpack in the Cascades. Uh, the, uh, the pine beetle in our forest, the longer fire season that's, that's chewing stuff up, the more acidic, Pacific Ocean, all of which have a uh, connection to carbon pollution. So that's a, a big problem. Uh, but, but essentially, uh, one of the ways resources are, are distributed is the Highway Trust Fund. Uh, the state makes the decisions on where it goes after it comes to the state. But if you don't have it, you can't repair roads. And, and for example, one of the things I do before town halls is uh, meet with your local elected commissioners and the mayors uh, in order to get their insights on what what is basically uh, needs attention. And so the Highway Trust Fund and funds directed to rural transportation projects, including a road here in this county that is is uh, slipping away, is an example of that. Out of that those discussions, I'm also. Uh, 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 I've crafted legislation that, that has the framework, the authorizing has passed that says we need to have money for rural water infrastructure projects because clean water, the cost of clean water supply and wastewater treatment are a very big challenge for the development of rural economies. Uh, yet another piece of the battle, you, you heard about the farm trucks earlier, but another piece is keeping our rural post offices open. There's a plan to close 41 of them. I stopped it. And uh, we've lost one that burned down. We didn't get replaced, but we've, we've kept the, the rest of them. So I want to keep collecting ideas from the, the county commissioners and the mayors and just keep jumping into those, uh, those, those battles. And the, um, it is, anyway, it's, it's an important focus to bring to basically every appropriation bill that goes through, through Congress. Thanks. So we're going to get started with questions? Yes. Okay, yes. so uh, I'm the person that does the drawing on the tickets, and I'm going to do three at a time, and then uh, and so that you'll know when you're in the queue. The first one, that all of them have 072, so let's skip the first three digits. 363 is number one. 356 is number two. And 37... Six is number three. Do you all do you get that? So we can go in any order. Three six Numbers three. Wave your hand. I'm Who's the three six three? That's me. Oh, we have to slip out. I don't think we got a couch show and a fun report going on. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. No. Who's three six three? Just bypass it. Good. Going, going, gone. Three five six. Go ahead. We've got a microphone for you right there. Just hold it a little closer to you. So on the uh, House side, they had a, a, a basically trade adjustment assistance, which is fancy words for helping workers who lose their jobs to to because their factories go overseas. That the, would be funded. Actually, it had a provision that funded it out of Medicare, uh, and um, the that the, the whole that whole piece of the puzzle failed, uh, and. Uh, now this, the trade bill is going to come back through the Senate without any adjustment assistance. But you, one, there should be trade adjustment assistance, and second, it shouldn't be by pulling it out of uh, Medicare. And third, uh, we should really hesitate before we pass this whole TPP to, to begin with. In fact, let me, uh, I shouldn't have said that yet, because let me <laughs> ignore what I just said. How many folks have heard of TPP? Of those of you who have heard of it, how many have a, a positive impression of what it will do for our economy? 
Okay? And how many have uh, concerns or a, a, a negative view of what it might do to our economy? Okay. Well, that's pretty much the reaction I've had all over the state. Um, I'd say crudely a 10 to 1 ratio. The, you can think of this trade agreement as three different agreements. One is intellectual property rights, copyright protection, patent protection. That's the extension of the rule of the law, and it protects the creators of ideas. It's a good thing. Uh, the second is agricultural provisions. The agricultural provisions, we don't have an analysis of them yet, so we don't know if they're good or bad. Uh, we're being told that it strikes down more tariffs and non-tariff barriers than it does overseas and it does to us, so that we should be a net beneficiary, but there's no analysis to actually demonstrate that. So, jury's out on that. But the third area is manufacturing. And what the uh, TPP does is it says our workers in manufacturing must compete directly with workers in countries that pay, say, only 60 cents an hour, which is the minimum wage in, in Vietnam. If you throw in other labor costs, you're talking at minimum a 20 to 1 differential in the cost of labor. Now, if you are a manufacturer, you want to make things in the cheapest possible place. That's an irresistible temptation to go make it where the labor costs are 1 20th of what it is in the United States. And we've already learned this. Uh, I took a look at the, the surge in um, trade deficit after China was joined the WTO. Our trade deficit went way up with China. I looked at uh, Korea after we did the trade agreement with Korea. Our trade deficit went way up. I looked at the trade deficit with Mexico after we did it with Mexico. Our trade deficit went way up. You start to see the pattern and it makes sense because the makers of things, the owners of companies that have multinational connections or can subcontract to have someone overseas make their product or make the inputs, the supply chain, they're going to move where it's cheapest. The result has been a loss, just since uh, North America freight trade agreement, of about 5 million manufacturing jobs in the United States and 50,000 factories. And this TPP is going to double down on that. Now you may hear an argument that this is a new breed of trade agreement, but I've gone down, I've looked at the trade agreement, I've looked to see what is in this new breed, and the fact is it's modeled basically on the free trade agreements we've done with Korea, Colombia, and so forth. The, uh, so there is no new enforcement mechanism on labor standards. There is no minimum wage. There is no enforcement system on environmental standards. So when people say there are these wonderful, enforceable labor and environmental standards, uh, I think that is a complete misrepresentation of, of the situation. And, uh, but the public will have a chance to weigh in because if the uh, fast track passes, which I think eventually it will get back through the Senate uh, without my support, but it, but it will probably win, then under the, what we have in that is 60 days of, citizen, of full publishment of the TPP before it's voted on by Congress. And so citizens will be able for themselves to be able to look and analyze and say what's, what's in this thing. Uh, so that will be good. But by then, the, the die is already cast because there will always be, already be the restriction on the, uh, the Senate of a time period and a simple up and down vote and no amendment. So the, the track is greased. But uh, that's my real concern is that if we don't make things in America, we're not going to have a middle class in, in America. And we've already seen a lot of jobs lost. Uh, we've seen, as you would expect from that, a polarization of wealth, that is, as, as workers collect less of a fair share of the value of making things, uh, well, then the investors make a bigger share, and the investors become more wealthy, and workers' wages do not go up, and that's what we've been seeing. So the evidence all points to the same place, which is uh, there should be real concern about expanding on a model that has been hurting uh, workers in America. That's my, that's my thoughts on it. But keep bringing your opinions, especially after you get a, uh, uh, the chance to look at it directly. ISDA? Oh, yeah. so, uh, yeah, well, a provision in this is the Investor State Dispute System, or ISDS. And this is, this is a concern in that it creates a panel of three corporate lawyers who could have been <laughs> advocates on a previous issue, but then they're judges on the next. And they get to decide whether or not 
a, an environmental law or a health and safety law uh, is something that, that has diminished the value of a foreign investor in the United States or vice versa in some other country. And the result is, are these, these cases are already going on under other trade agreements. For example, tobacco companies saying, hey, requirements that you put a warning on a package of cigarettes decreases the value of our investment in making cigarettes, so the country must compensate us or get rid of their consumer protection law on cigarettes. That's an example of the type of, of problem. And we have not lost any of these cases in the U.S., but we haven't lost the ones with an ISDS, but we've lost ones with the WTO. We lost the dolphin free tuna law, we lost the uh, turtle safe um, uh, law, we lost the, and we just lost a couple weeks ago, the ability to label meat made in America or produced in America. I want to live in a country where we can label our products so consumers can have a choice if they want to to have um, American meat rather than Mexican <coughs> meat, they should have the ability to have the information to make that decision. Often the cattle are raised under very different circumstances. And maybe people want to support American ranchers. They, should, they can't do that if they don't have the information. And if our legislature at a local or national level says, says this is something our citizens want, they pass it, I don't want it to be a situation where our sovereignty is handed over to a panel of three corporate lawyers uh, to decide whether or not we can have these safety and environmental provisions. So that, that is a um, significant uh, concern as well. Thank you, for, thank you for mentioning it. Okay, well, let's, let's keep going so we get on to more, and I'll try to be uh, more brief. Next person is 376, and then after that is 381. Good afternoon, Senator. Uh, my name is Bob Reese from Bay City. I'm the North Coast co-president for the Association of Northwest Steelheaders, as well as the executive director. Um, we are uh, primarily interested in fish issues, which you've been uh, very cooperative on. Uh, you've really helped out the sportsmen here in, in uh, Northwest Oregon and all of Oregon, for that matter. Um, I want to have you talk a little bit about the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We had uh, a piece of property down in the estuary that was purchased with land and water conservation funds, saltwater marsh habitat. Incredible value out of this fund, uh, and it's up for reauthorization, I think, by September. If you could talk a little bit about your support for it and um, the chances for reauthorization. It's a 50-year-old program, as you know, and, and has a tremendous amount of value for sports anglers, uh, hunters, those that need access to public lands. So this fund comes from a fee on offshore drilling. And it was part of the decision when that drilling leases were allowed way back when to make some benefit to uh, the country in terms of conservation values. And, and states use this in all kinds of, of ways for critical pieces of, of habitat, uh, as you described. Uh, the, the fund, the money that has been collected in fees has not fully been allocated to the Land Water Conservation Fund. So it's been, a bunch of it's been kind of snuck aside for use in other ways. I support using every dollar that comes from, from those fees that were supposed to be dedicated to that to use it in this area. Uh, now we're concerned uh, about whether or not we'll get reauthorization of it. Uh, and that is a, uh, a challenge. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm very worried about whether or not this will, uh, will continue to be there to help communities buy critical pieces of, of uh, habitat. And so uh, I'll, I'll keep fighting for it, but, it, but it's going to take a lot of sports fishermen and other groups across this country weighing in with their legislators to, to win this effort. 381 is next, and then followed is 377. 381? We can come back to you if you wave your hand later. Okay. okay. 377. Good afternoon. I can take a several questions. I'm not sure which one is the, is the touching on his question. The Nature Conservancy is not doing us a favor out here on the coast. They take farmland out of production, take it off the tax rolls, and generally do it with our money. So if you want to eat, You've got, you've got a problem. We've got a problem with our roads out here. The state has advocated 
for bicyclists out there, and those roads are in no way safe for bicycles. There was a man from California that was bicycling the coast that was killed by a fellow that I know. And I asked him what was what was the problem. He said, I came around this dead, this blind corner, the sun was in my eyes, and he was in the middle of the lane in the shade. Now there is no shoulders on that road that a bicycle can get out of your way. And if he's there, you're going to have to make, do the next best thing. What can you do about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, the most important thing is that we actually fund the National Highway Trust Fund so that there will be funds that will come to the states to assist them. The state uh, is working on its own transportation uh, package. And I'm not sure if Debbie Boone is still here or not. Debbie, do you want to comment on this at all? This is the, uh, so uh, the short version, um, how can we team up to have the funds to improve primarily Highway 101 you were talking about? Well, Highway 101, 153. Okay. How can, we, how can we broaden the, get the money to broaden the shoulders so that the bicyclists, which are uh, encouraged and are a good source of tourist revenue, how can we make sure that, that the roads are actually designed to, to accommodate them? I guess that's... Well, first of all, um, and to reiterate what Debbie said, point, we lost one of our very staunch transportation advocates uh, last month in Shirley Calco, the mayor of Mahalem. She was also chair of the Northwest Act, which is how the planning process goes in Oregon uh, with ODOT. Um, <coughs> you can't just say we want this project and submit that and have it happen. It has to be part of a long-term plan, but uh, Commissioner Labhart just said transportation package. And while our transportation package is mostly designed around infrastructure, maintenance, um, I think that that fits right in because that's dealing with the problems that we have. And um, and I, and we, we can't legislate on the sense, but that's a lot of what you're talking about too. Well, I will, I will say the, uh, the highway, the National Highway Trust Fund that I'm fighting to have reauthorized and funded, uh, those monies go to the state and the state sets its priorities for how those funds are used. But I, I do think that there might be a way for our state legislators to advocate for those, that there is a priority in having the shoulders wide enough for bicycles on roads where we're actively soliciting people to come and, and bicycle. And I've ridden on a bunch of roads that didn't have a shoulder and prayed I'd live to see at the end of the day. <laughs> so I understand exactly what you're talking about. Thanks for raising it. Next person is, uh, the next number is 357. And then after that is 358. Three five seven. Well, that's me, but I already okay. answered. Okay. Three five eight. I'll we'll get your microphone. I'd like to know what's being done about closing the revolving doors between these corporations and our government. So the question was about closing the revolving door between corporations and the government. Well, a few years ago, there, was, there were some provisions that were passed. For example, uh, at the federal level, if, you are, if you're serving in office uh, or if you're serving in staff to one of our congressional folks, there's a, a one-year prohibition on serving in a lobbyist role. Uh, I must say that I don't think it has much practical effect because if people who have left the legislature in the time that I've been there, left Congress on the House or Senate side, often become uh, strategic advisors or <laughs> consultants. Uh, basically, they can't directly talk with a legislator for a year, but they can do all kinds of work of advice and so forth. And so it doesn't, and then after a year, that, that's, that's, that's lifted. An area that I'm more concerned about than that is in our regulation of, of Wall Street because essentially we used to have a career track that were regulators and a career track that was Wall Street, and one saw themselves as serious watchdogs of behavior of the other. But now our top regulators are pulled in from Wall Street, and when they get done, they go back to Wall Street with million dollar plus jobs. And so they have no incentive to actually be very serious about 
having the regulations followed. Uh, so that is a problem. I don't really, I don't, <coughs> I've, I don't know the best answer to it. Uh, the financial world has gotten complex enough and the system is disrupted enough now that you need people who understand the inside of how things work. But if they can come in, if, if you don't allow them to go back, they might not come in in the first place. Uh, and uh, if they're allowed to go back, then their objectivity is suspect. So it's, it's a real problem. And uh, feel free to share your ideas on, on how we should tackle it. Instead of a year, why don't we make it five years? How about just eliminate it? It, it could, that could work. The question, uh, the suggestion was make it a longer period of time than a year, but then you have five year strategic consultants. Uh, so I'm not, I'm just, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm, I haven't had any ideas brought to me by any consumer groups that are working on this issue, but I think it's a real, real challenge. Another challenge is the expediency with which regulations are written or not written, and we still have for example, a provision for say on, no, it wasn't say on pay, but it was disclosure of, of, of corporate incomes to do a, a calculation of, 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 for publicly traded companies of how the CEO pay compares to the average worker in the firm. Pretty straightforward thing. It's been five years, the regulation has never been written. Uh, the introduction crowdfunding was mentioned. This was something that I was very pleased to champion, which was a way to raise investor capital for small businesses. Yeah. And it was supposed to take six months to do the rules. We're now four plus years into it. Rules have never been written. And now states are doing their own crowdfunding investor provisions. Oregon now has a crowdfunding system based on the federal one that I championed. But the federal has never been completed. The rules have never been completed. And so that's a, another piece of the puzzle that needs a, a lot, of, lot of work. If you go, and what's happened is there's become a strategy of slowing down the production of regulations. So if you can make writing the regulation that should take months into a five-year process, you have a chance to get people elected to come back and stop it from ever going into effect in the first place. And that's just a dysfunctional system. Or if it takes over five years. Well, and, and so this is a, a piece of the puzzle here is the enormous role of corporate funds in campaigns. There is a... a uh, a court decision, Citizens United, have you heard of Citizens United? <laughs> so Citizens United said there's nothing corrosive or corrupting for democracy to have unlimited corporate funds. And even, even undisclosed source, secret corporate funds. And realize corporations aren't necessarily American corporations. Yeah. Uh, so we're not talking about just American funds. I mean, there are, you, you, foreign individuals can't donate, but Corporations, that's another, another story altogether. So we had a very, uh, I, I would say, scary election cycle. Scary in terms of what it means for a democracy, for a we the people democracy. We had uh, the Koch brothers announce that they were going to hold a meeting of 300 billionaires in California to raise 300 to 500 million dollars to secure control of the Senate for their agenda. Now, did any of you get an invitation to that meeting down in California? <laughs> I don't know that anybody in Oregon uh, got an invitation. Uh, the, um, and then they held a vetting conference for candidates in Texas, where candidates for the US Senate were asked to come and sign on to Americans for Prosperity agenda. And the implication was that if you sign on, then they would spend money in third party campaigns to destroy your opponent. And then they proceeded, so they held that, then they proceeded to spend that money as they had said they would. They spent it in Louisiana, in Arkansas, in North Carolina, New Hampshire, Iowa, Colorado, Michigan, and Oregon, and Alaska. And they won virtually all those races except New Hampshire, Michigan, and Oregon. In, in, in two of the states, they pulled out early. Michigan and Oregon. So thank you for kicking the Koch brothers out of our state. Yeah. That was well done. Don't need them. The, uh, but that didn't stop there. What they have done is announce in January of this year that they're going to spend shy of a billion dollars in the next cycle 
to keep control of the legislature and, and win the presidency for their, their agenda. This is not government as President Lincoln described it, of by and for the people. This is government by and for the titans. And that's a very different philosophy. And when we have issues that are affecting whether or not working people are empowered in this country, it was Roosevelt, in a speech he gave in, in 1940, he said, he laid out his goal of workers getting a fair share of the productivity of America. So that in a country like ours, where everyone ha should have the ability to have a good paying job, a living wage job. And that fair share, that, that is relevant to what I was talking about in terms of the trade treaty. Uh, because you basically have an investor, um, these, uh, an investor, uh, uh, I guess, uh, benefit uh, from making things in the lowest cost place, and you have a worker disaster from the results of, of making things in the very the place that pays the, the, the very least. And that tension is uh, uh, really it goes to the heart of who we are, who we are as a who we are as a country. So this uh, the ability of these vast concentration of, of corporate funds uh, is a really is it's a it's a really big deal, and there are a few things we can do about it. Uh, the SEC Securities Exchange Commission could require that all public companies disclose their political spending. If you if you agree with the Supreme Court that your money is your speech, then people who own a share of stock, it is their money being spent. They ought to be able to know how that money is being spent, otherwise it's stolen speech. We shouldn't allow stolen speech in America. We should close the loophole that lets charitable donations to 501c4 be used for political purposes. Uh, we should proceed to in encourage uh, companies, uh, just in terms of uh, public citizenship, to disclose how they spend their, their money. And I'm hoping that at some point, one of the five justices uh, who voted to give that there's no, nothing corrupting or corrosive about this huge concentration of power, I'm hoping they'll step down and be replaced by somebody who actually believes in a we the people democracy as in, enshrined in our Constitution. So we have uh, time for two more questions, and, uh, but before we go any further, the, the, the race in Oregon that he's referring to was his poem. Yeah. So oh, yeah, yeah. We appreciate the fact that he won. Yeah, thank God. And so the next person is 360. Are you here? And then the next person after that is three seven five. Are you here? Okay. So you, I'm gonna. I have to go to the same memorial that uh, that uh, the other, other people are going to. So I'm gonna be leaving, but you know you're up next. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for having seen. Appreciate it. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for coming. And I'm here because I was worried about like Port of Newport getting a grant money used to export logs overseas, and now that's going to affect our economy locally, and jobs away from us. So is the, the port is applying for a grant? They already got it. Uh, to, okay, I'm not familiar with that specifically, uh, so I'll have to do a little bit of research in, in that regard. Uh, Katie is here. Katie? Katie's right over here. So she's my field representative. She'll follow up and get the information. I'll learn about it, and uh, I'll, I'll get, get back to you. I, I will say this about the export of logs. We're like a third world country right now, in that we are harvesting a huge number of logs. And I, I, I think you're clapping because we shouldn't be, right? We shouldn't be a third world country. Just want to make sure. Sure of that. Yeah. And uh, it used to be we had vertically integrated timber companies, so they harvested logs and sent them to their own mills. But now it's, that's no longer the way it works. The, the folks who own the, the, the log, the land, the timber land, don't own the mills, and so they sell it to the highest bidder. And that right now, that highest bidder is over overseas. We also then had a period where where companies kept their logs here because in order to bid on public logs, you had to keep your logs here and have them go through our mills. That's the public logs are not enough big enough player anymore for for that. But if we can have incentives that keep those logs produced into lumber here, so we can add the value and add the jobs in the mills, it would be hugely beneficial. And I'm backing a big research project by Oregon State University, and it's a partnership right now with D.R. Johnson Mill down in Riddle, which I, I just visited, to do what is, is uh, called cross-laminated 
lumber. And what they do is they lay out two by fours or two by sixes one way and then the other way. And then they can finger join them and they can produce very large sheets of three to five, three to seven layers of cross laminated timber. And what it, you can do with this is you can build high rise buildings with it instead of steel and concrete. And Australia is doing this, and Europe is doing this, and America hasn't been. But if we can develop that technology here, uh, then we have a, a chance of raising the value of the lumber. And then that means keep, that's an economic way for those logs to be kept here and, and turned into uh, products that can be uh, utilized locally. Uh, plus, it has the added addition of essentially you're locking up carbon in those big, massive pieces. And so it's a very interesting uh, technology that um, really, uh, I saw the Oregon State t-shirt back here, the Oregon State is championing the development of, and I'm working through appropriations to, to get funding to keep that work going. Yes? Could you please uh, comment on the seven murders in Charleston, South Carolina, the oh, church there, and then nine. Fly, the Confederate flag? Nine. Nine? Nine. Well, it's, an enormous, enormous tragedy, and it's um, uh, we have across the country uh, folks sometimes from mental illness and sometimes from ideologically gone off in the wrong track uh, end up doing horrific things, uh, and uh, I think we should all be holding that community in our hearts and our prayers right now. Is there anything you wanted to add about, about it? Just to follow up, the Confederate flag, flying the Confederate flag to the Capitol in South Carolina, how that relates to what happened. Well, I find it completely inappropriate. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know the issue from the legal side in terms of states' rights to fly flags. And, and uh, uh, our First Amendment powers in this country often protect actions that we find reprehensible. I find this uh, rep a reprehensible uh, situation. Well, with on that note, <laughs> thank you all. This is such a beautiful day over here on the coast, and uh, very few senators still hold town halls. Uh, Senator Wyden does, and I follow his example. I learn a great deal from them, but in this polarized society, um, most of the senators in the U.S. they they don't they don't want to do community forums. Uh, this is uh, my 30. I do 36 of these every year, one in every county. Uh, a lot of the issues I'm working on come out of comments that people have made, and plus when I follow up on questions I'm not familiar with, I learn more. Like in regard to the uh, the, the grant that the gentleman referred to, I'll I'll follow up on that. But thank you for taking your time on a, on, a, on a beautiful weekend day to come and be part of this dialogue. This type of dialogue is essential to a We the People democracy. Thank you. Keep up.